Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you to the fourth panel of the IBP Legacy Dialogue. It is time for us to commemorate and celebrate the former president, General Ibrahim Fadimati Mangida, as he turns 80. And this particular panel is a very special one. But before we delve into what the title of the panel is, Please permit me to welcome and greet um, the personalities that will be joining us uh, today. Um, I'd like to start um, with those that we can see who are joining us virtually before I invite those who are physically present here. Permit me to welcome the very distinguished Senator Ike Katsuna Mwachuku a soldier and a gentleman, Nigeria's former Minister of Employment, Labour and Productivity. He was also Minister of Foreign Affairs 1987-1989. And he was reappointed in 1990 and served until 1993. Chairman of the Liberty Committee of the OAU and three-term chairman of the ECOWAS States Council of Ministers as a senator representing Abia State in the National Assembly, he was chair of several committees. A very distinguished senator, Ike Machiko. It's good to see you, sir. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for inviting me. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear, sir. Thank you. Akinyemi. Professor Bolaji Akinyemi is a professor of political science. He was external affairs minister from 1985 to late 1987. Cerebral and Eldad is an academic and technocrat, visiting professor at the Graduate Institute at University of Nairobi, mm -hmm. and one time yeah, get um, visiting professor also at the Graduate yeah. Institute of International Studies in Geneva, lecturer at University of California, University of Lagos, and visiting fellow at the St. John's College, Cambridge, in England. It's good to see you, sir. Thank you, John. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I'd like at this point to invite the President General of Ohaneze in Igbo. Ambassador, mm -hmm. Professor, a man of many parts, the very respected Professor George Gilles, former Nigerian ambassador to the United States of America, the State of Israel, Republic of Cyprus, Director General, Nigerian Institute of International Affairs, and advisor to several multiple presidents, a member of the Presidential Advisory Committee 2014 Conference, by President Goodluck Jonathan, and he was also an advisor to the Honorable Minister of Foreign Affairs. Please help me give an Abuja welcome to Professor George Ogiozzi. Thank you, Abuja. Thank you, Abuja. Thank you, sir. I'm very pleased to be introducing the next gentleman who has served Nigeria in various um, positions the very respected Professor Tunde Abdeniron is a Nigerian scholar, politician, diplomat, and former Minister of Education. He served nationally and internationally and worked at the United Nations and also served as Nigeria's ambassador to Germany, chairman of the Directorate for Social Mobilization, MAMSA, advisor on many national committees, and member of the political bureau. Professor Tunde Abdeniron. And we welcome him by encouraging him to I have on this panel a very cerebral gentlemen whose duty today in the discourse will be to look at Nigeria's foreign policy and pan-Africanism under the era of our celebrant. So here is the format for panel four. 
I'm going to be coming to the panelists, each and every one, for the initial time of five minutes. And when I direct the questions at them, I would expect that you would speak for five minutes only. And whatever else they need to say, they can say in the remaining three minutes that will be allocated to them after that. Two, three minute slots will be allocated to them after the initial five minutes. This is to keep the panel very engaging and for us all to be able to follow through what they are going to be talking about. According to political and foreign policy scholars, Nigeria has been guided by a high sense of responsibility and not through selfish interest. Far beyond her borders, Nigeria is Africa's most populous black country in the world. She is compelled to shoulder willingly and unwillingly the leadership of a black world. Against this background, Rosamund, who placed premium on Nigeria's role as a power to be reckoned with as president of Nigeria, President Baba Gida thrust Nigeria forward as a regional power and is credited with placing Nigeria in the forefront of African leadership with its many foreign policy thrusts. As a pan-Africanist who believes in pan-Africanism, ultimately that belief showed as soon as he took uh, uh, position as president, and that belief is that all Africans should unite under one umbrella and should be celebrated in their unity. Former President Babangida is the architect of the Abuja Treaty, which led to the Africa Economic Summit. According to international relations scholar, historian Agoawa, writing in 2007, the nature of man compels everyone to interact and have mutual dependency. No matter who we are, we cannot survive in isolation. Therefore, we have tendencies to relate with each other locally, globally, and internationally. It is against this background that we examine Nigeria's foreign policy and pan-Africanism under the era of a man who we honor today as he turns 80. Permit me to start immediately in this conversation and intervention by going straight away to speak to the first person I'll be addressing will be the respected Professor Bolaji Akinemi. Let me begin with you, sir. In President Babakina's foreign policy team, he leveraged on the men and women in the ivory tower. How would you describe the impact of this decision in his foreign policy direction? Obviously, as someone said in the previous panel, men of ideas tend to create and enforce a vision that is already present, not only in their thinking, but also in the thinking of whoever made the appointment. I mean, obviously, a president may not know you personally, but if he's conversant with your ideas, and he thinks he can live with your ideas, and your ideas are in sync with what he himself has in mind, it makes the appointment all that easy. I was at the Nigerian Institute of International Affairs for eight years, and during that time, I was aware of the presence of, it was first of all, Lieutenant Colonel, the full Colonel, the Brigadier. He always attended our public lectures. And even though I tried to get him to come and sit at the high table, he would simply go and sit at the back. He would drive himself to the venue. And this he did for the eight years I was at the institute. So obviously he was aware of what we were thinking about at the institute. He was in sync with that. And therefore, when he then got into the seat of power, I suppose it was easy for him to then call upon me to come and help him direct the affairs of the um, Ministry of um, External Affairs. But let me quickly tell a little funny story. 
when the appointment was made, we had the British foreign minister already visiting Nigeria. Larry Konya was the acting foreign minister at that time. And he had invited me to the dinner in honor of the British foreign minister. I wasn't the foreign minister at that time. The appointment has not been made. So I accepted to attend the dinner. And then the announcement came that I was going to be the minister. And the question then was, should I attend the dinner or not? I consulted with those I needed to talk to, and they agreed with me that I shouldn't, because I would have created an embarrassing situation for Larry Conway, who was the acting for it. So I didn't go to the dinner. But I met the British Foreign Minister privately in the House of the Permanent Secretary. And I knew at that time what was expected. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lord. Um, it's, clear, it's clear that he had a, a great relationship with members of the academia. Uh, we all know by looking at the team he put together, uh, and in conversation with our celebrant at some point um, or the other, he did say that most of the persons um, that he brought in were some of them, those who knew their quality already and who were his friends uh, because he had met them at places of interest like you had rightly observed. And some of them were people he didn't know. Their credibility just brought them to the fore. I would like to thank Professor Akiemi for illuminating that area of thought for us. And I'd like at this point to um, go to the respected Professor George Obiozu. You were diplomat and academic. Um, you have served as a diplomat across many countries in the world for Nigeria. You are also former Director General of the Nigerian Institute of International Affairs. <clears throat> Excuse me. Tell us what in his personality, what his type of person did for engaging foreign leaders and how this led to real international and regional relations, and how Nigeria benefited. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate President Nurangina on his uh, 80th anniversary of his birthday. I want to actually, most sincerely, congratulate Her Excellency Aisha Babangina, a great daughter. You have done a great honor by getting this distinguished children together to celebrate your wonderful father. In fact, under Babangida, the first thing you know is that the president or head of state of any country is the chief diplomat. He's the country's chief diplomat. What makes a country great is the trinity of assessment of a country's military strategic position in the world. How far can you reach in defending yourself and your relatives and friends across the globe? The other is military diplomatic. Who are your friends in the world? Which countries in the world will catch cold when you cough? And the third is strong economic base and domestic political stability to push your idea in a world of competitive and controversial issues of national security, national prosperity, peace, honor, and prestige. The man IDB, the first and most important thing about him is the inspiring style of leadership with this man. When you, when you see a leader, you will not be told that he's a leader. The inspiring confidence, in fact, in him, will enable you to assess him automatically as a committed leader. What can one say about President Adidu? A man of great versatility, intellect, charisma, and great achievements. 
and leader who restored the confidence of citizens in a precarious country struggling to hold itself. President Gandhi used his charisma of emotional intelligence to reattach Nigerians to the cause of nation building. The sheer force and energy of his capital, uh, uh, captivating leadership qualities also caught the attention of the international community. Indeed, there's always a linkage between your own country, the perception of your country, and the way the world will look at you. In fact, as a nationalist with inclusive attitude and approach to governance, he did not tolerate tribalism, ethnic or sectional sentiments. He had friends across the country, and I will say it, in the ancient times, to know how powerful you are or how popular you are, you must have friends in anywhere you are going, on the, on the road where you are going. If it becomes dark, you have a place to stay until the morning so you can continue your journey. It means that either you have in-laws in those on that road, or you have a friend. For I may be, he had friends in every part of Nigeria. Anywhere he reached in the night, he can go to any friend that's there. He was a great man. Indeed, a great idea of what Nigeria and Nigeria stood for at the end of the Civil War. No victor, no country. For him, it was not a mere word. He was historically conscious of the fact that Nigeria, a country born in optimism, living generally in uncertainty, and seemingly a tragedy waiting to happen, needed leadership, and he provided it. Let's stop you there, Prof, for a second. I'll come back to you for us to expand on those conversations. Well, but at this point, I'd like to go very quickly to um, the former Foreign Affairs Minister, distinguished Senator Ikim Wachukwu. Um, I'd like to find out from you, sir, um, what was it um, that, that decided, that engagement that Nigeria decided to get involved in across the West African sub-region? Um, as a consultant to ECOWAS at some point, uh, I visited Sierra Leone, and we traveled in an economic vehicle. And at some, uh, you know, some of the persons by the roadside who were waving and cheering uh, unnerved me a little bit, and I began to think, why are they greeting us like this? Uh, until the ambassador said to me, you know, anywhere Ekomok goes, Ekomok was able to rescue these countries, and we know that this engagement happened under the belt of our celebrants today. I'd like, therefore, um, to ask distinguished Senator Ekim Wachiku to talk us through that economic engagement and what it meant for Nigeria's foreign policy. Uh, in a manner that we put them down, I the man IBP, uh, which came on a long ways back as a young officer. Uh, the teaching of the Nigerian Defense Academy. He, a company officer, and I, as the adjutant of the, of the of the academy, we learned a great deal about militarism was there, and we discussed and defined what Nigeria should be, what we can all do to salvage her and to prop her and to put her at the pedestal where, where she ought to be in African and world affairs. But so when the crisis in Liberia and Sierra Leone came up, uh, and IBB, the president of Nigeria, he made bold to commit to find any solution to that problem. Of course, he got uh, a president, president of Ghana, David Rollins, uh, in the demo of Atoko, uh, uh, 
the president of the Gambia, Jawara, and uh, later on, Hufa uh, Buena, to join in salvaging that country. He understood quite clearly in the real day that any major destabilization in Liberia and Sierra Leone was snowballed into other parts of the country. And he also understood clearly that no other regional power would wish to come to our own part to salvage us, except we did ourselves. So he was in the forefront of ensuring that that happened. He then got Echo, um, Echo Mogoye and assigned late Lieutenant General Dogon Yaro as force commander, having taken over from the Queen of Ghana when things were going properly there. And Dogon Yaro showed tremendous leadership. At that point, I've been appointed foreign minister I worked so closely with him in ensuring that the vision of Babangida to bring peace to our sovereignty and to give honor to Nigeria and the black race that we could deal with our own problems ourselves, we jointly pushed and in the end brought peace and sanity back to Liberia and back to Sierra Leone. It cost the country a lot of money and lives of our troops. But it was something that ought to have been done and was done and was done properly well. And there's no how you can write the history of crisis in Sierra Leone and in Liberia without giving General Ibrahim Badamasi Babangida thumbs up for great leadership, for courage, for understanding the politics of international relations, and for understanding so clearly that it's Nigeria and Nigeria alone, of our support of others, that can salvage the image and the integrity of the black man anywhere in the world. And of course, from Liberia, he also ventured into other areas, Angola, Mozambique, uh, 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 um, uh, Namibia, uh, South Africa, Zimbabwe, and all of that. <coughs> now, I don't know how much more time I've, I've got, but it is interesting to note that Ibrahim Babangida wasn't afraid of ideas. It has been said before. He's prepared, he has the intellectual strength not to be afraid of other intellectuals around him. He was, he was happiest when you could debate with them. And if you had a much better point than he has, he would tell you to go ahead and implement as you did fit what we want. If it, if it went well, he would take the credit. But if he didn't, he's prepared to, to uh, relieve you. But he will pray that that shouldn't be so. So that was my brother, a man of tremendous understanding of world affairs, a man of tremendous understanding of what the black race should stand for, a man of great understanding of why Nigerian unity should be, should be kept, a man who will not care about where you come from. Or he will care about is who you are, what you are, what you can contribute to building a nation and a society. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. I heard you describe him as a man who understood world affairs. And I'd like to return to you, uh, distinguished Senator, sir. I'd like to find out from you in just two or three sentences um, to wrap up that conversation and that intervention we had. What would have been if ECOMOC did not exist for the West African sub-region, and particularly for Nigeria, 
in just two sentences, could you could you just look back and say, had ECOMOG not taken place within the foreign policy ideas of President Babangida, what could have been? You are also a general, so perhaps you might want to be able to illuminate us on that. Uh, what is happening here in our country would be would be a child's play. Uh, if Reverend Bangida, man of vision, a man of courage, has shown it many, many times on the battlefield, stopping coups, uh, stepping out to be counted when it's important, helped to ensure that West African sub-region remains safe. Today, there's trade, there's, there's, there's development, there's peace, there's understanding, and the West African sub-region cannot be set aside anymore. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to come to Professor Tunde Adenino. Um, Nigeria is considered a medium power, and this position is enough to alienate our African uh, brothers. Um, because already they have been um, dumbed down by imperialism, colonialism, and neocolonialism. It would be nice to hear you give us an insight into the foreign policy thrust that the former president used to bring his brothers into the fold and prevent that alienation thought that runs through the minds of smaller countries when they envision Nigeria and the power in which is vested in Nigeria as Africa's most populous nation. Uh, one of the things that uh, one will get out of his initial statements when he took over was the fact that he was bothered, very worried, about the fact that there are some policy consistencies uh, they could no longer trust us, particularly our brothers, and, uh, their neighbors, and he felt that something really had to be done about it. Uh, he started, he did not just bump on them with the policies, foreign policies of Nigeria, he started by reassuring them that indeed we are their brothers. At that time, if we could go back, we would recall that the borders were closed between us and our other you know, neighbors. There was embargo, and of course, the regime that was before him are sending away Africans from Nigeria. And he took over against that background and he realized what had to be done. He took Africa as one and of course those in the West African sub-region as members of the um, of the same family, so forth. So by reassuring them by taking certain steps to guarantee their security economically bringing them to appreciate the fact that Nigeria can be trusted. Some of the policies that he now initiated became easy to be implemented. One, uh, we could recall that in 1986-87, he was chairman of FECOAS. And during that period, he treated them the way they should be treated, as members of the same community. Moving on from there, 1991, very he became the OAU you know, uh, chairman. Of course, it was an extension of what he was doing before. He took Africa with seriousness. It is not, uh, it, it was not following what was before. Because he was able to assert himself or something to, to reassure them that he did Nigeria will be whatever Nigeria promised to be, a big brother, sort of, and that Nigeria could be trusted. He stood on that, and by matching action with words, there was no way anyone could have given, I mean, had any uh, wrong opinion or to disbelieve him that he did, he did not mean well for them. So he cultivated them and their trust, their confidence and their confidence. He cultivated them. Indeed, that tells us um, the sort of foreign policy ideas that he was working with and the fact that he has shown other West African and African states of, 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 of Nigeria's position in supporting them and carrying them along was one of the reasons for which that was such a robust foreign policy period in Nigeria's history. I'd like to return to you, Professor George Piozo. I'd like to find out from you 
how did our uh, uh, celebrant, uh, the very respected uh, former president, use cultural diplomacy as a tool for international relations, seeing how very rich Nigeria's culture is and seeing uh, how much of a pan-Africanist he was? In fact, in fact in the President Babangida, Ila, in terms of foreign policy, made Nigeria the essential country in Africa and the country that you cannot overlook a view in Africa. In other words, as in the, what you said, it was inconceivable that peace in Africa can be done or concluded by any other group, including the international community, without Nigerian contribution. Nigeria took Africa since the First Republic as a priority. So Pan-Africanism was born with Nigeria and actually baptized on October 7th by the wonderful speech of Prime Minister Safar Benewa, who was at that time also acting as Foreign Minister of Nigeria until he died away. What is important is that Nigeria being leadership position, being a leadership position in Africa, will have no meaning, whether to Africans or to the world, unless Nigeria carry, carry them along. It is indeed that involvement, intensity of that involvement, that made the African countries rely intensely on Nigerian contributions. In fact, it can be argued, but the reality is there that without Nigerian contribution, whether West African peace or African liberation in general, particularly in South Africa, would have gone as fast or successful. We saw that in the speeches of, of uh, Nelson Mandela, the gratitude of South African under him. What is important is that the Nigerian foreign policy has generally been consistent. What is the difference is the leadership style at any time. And under Babangida, things became like Babangida himself, active, active, active. Here is a man who will carry the international community the same way he carried the Nigerians, with emotion and mission. He was a very conspicuous leader. That is extremely important. This leader had no recognition of most of the leaders of the world. And uh, my first job with him was as a special assistant on international affairs. I remember the speeches that uh, President Babangida made in, uh, in uh, OAU, Addis Ababa, 25th anniversary of OAU in 1988. That was when Nigeria's leadership was seriously confirmed. I remember the, the present speech in the UN. And that day, too, Nigeria's leadership in Africa was considered. What is important for us to do is to learn some lessons from the 
from this great leader because his during his term it was the second time that Nigeria was the highest peak in foreign policy and international relations. In fact, the world recognition was unbelievably enthusiastic about the future of Nigeria and the role of Nigeria. When Balewa came to the world, as a, when Nigeria was born, and Balewa was giving the maiden speech, as I mentioned, in October 7th at the UN. During that period, the world knew Nigeria and admired Nigeria. The next highlight of Nigerian foreign policy will come under IBD. And definitely the third phase was under Basindu. If you look at it, not just substance, but style matters in international relations. In international relations, in diplomacy, perception comes before reality. And that is very important. How a country regards your leader matters how they regard the country. If at the top, the creator of modern Turkey, nobody can treat your leader with his disdain and like his country. Leadership, as I want to tell you, whether it's on domestic or foreign policy matters a lot. And you must keep leadership going by being doing that, being dynamic and doing something. Leadership is an end, not inherited. And I mean he worked as a leader. And African leaders recognize him as that. I want to thank you, Professor George Obioza. You have spoken well. As always, you have been quite robust in your contributions. I'd like to return to Professor Bola Jiakinyemi. Uh, the good professor, sir. Nigeria's relationship with multinational and multilateral organizations suggests that during the IBB era and uh, going forward, Nigerians were placed in very important positions across the world. Nigerians were expected um, to seek for positions and Nigeria always was supported to attain those positions in multilateral organizations. In addition to which I'd like to ask you, uh, being a two-pronged question, to quickly give us that intervention in, in three minutes if you can. How did we relate with the multilateral agencies and the big multilateral organizations across the world at this time? I will simply build on what my friend Professor Biazza has said. If your president shows an interest in foreign affairs and he was prepared to back that up with action and resources, then whatever posts you are interested in, provided they are zoned to Africa, you will get it. It is enough of your leadership role because you must first of all get the West African sub-region to endorse your candidate, then the OAU, and that's what it was called at that time, to endorse your candidate, and the United Nations will, will simply put a stamp of approval on your candidate. And it was successfully done um, throughout the period that we are talking about. Uh, that there is a, a little amendment I would like to make to what uh, Professor Bielsa has said. The time of Mutala Muhammad must also be regarded as one of the activist periods of our foreign policy. Um, so that he, he's talked about a three phase, maybe we will not say it's a four phase uh, period that we have of an um, active uh, foreign policy uh, posture. But we, we have, I, I just wish that 
President Nagandira would have visited more countries in the world to back up his interest and Nigerian interest. Um, he, he tended to stay at home and leave the visits to his foreign ministers, as uh, General Ikewatu Kubo confirmed. Uh, I think his visibility, not only on the African continent, but on the, in the world, will have been enhanced by him traveling more uh, around the world than he actually did. But we, we had a successful run um, in terms of uh, the foreign policy goals. The, the looking into the future was what he also did because we knew by that time that the anti-apartheid struggle was going to be over and Nigeria needed to develop a new concept of foreign policy for the future. And this was where then the concept of the concept of medium powers came in. This was also why we designed the technical aid course scheme that will establish a Nigerian presence in low income and medium income countries. It was part of designing a post apartheid foreign policy for the for, for uh, foreign policy for Nigeria. And that is still work in progress that I hope will be built upon. I thank you, sir. I thank you most sincerely. I'd like to come to you, Professor Adeniro, for your last intervention before we do our one-minute roundups. Um, you were chairman of uh, MAMSA. Uh, you understood that it was important that Nigeria's position internally uh, was in a place where other nations gaze upon it, um, made things uh, more um, exciting uh, in the foreign front. Uh, what would you say MAMSA did in terms of situating Nigeria across the world as a nation to be watched? What MAMSA did, other than derived from the policy, the, the, the vision of uh, IBB, uh, which was, he set up, first of all, the political bureau. MAMSA was a product of the political bureau. And it came out of the Ingenuity, the, the, the man, visionary, a genius indeed. They stayed the consistency. By the time the political group made that recommendation, he took half months out of it and wanted the people of Nigeria to be mobilized so as to support the development that that he was intending to make happen within the domestic environment. Because he could see then that the uh, relationship between the domestic and the foreign policy has been the surface. There is no way we can succeed externally, we do not succeed domestically. So while people are being mobilized here, yeah, he was also reaching out. What yeah, Mansa did in, uh, in, in summary is that looking at what the man was trying to do, not just the body language or the, the speeches he was making, we realized that through the briefing and the brief that was got. We knew where it was going, and we thought that it would be necessary for us to achieve three things. One, to ensure that Nigerians are properly mobilized. If we do not sensitize them and educate them about their rights and responsibilities and what has to be done to make sure that the country is what it will be, you will not get anywhere. The second is that the regime in power at that time, that is IBB, he had a mission and a mission. And we have to locate this within that framework. And of course, because he knew very well the parapyramid of actors with the dating the Nigerian political process, he could relate with us to also link up with some of the people and the forces that we were able to get to support that mission. And in projecting to the future, we knew what we did at that time would lead somewhere by linking up, liaising with the foreign agents and the embassies and so on. And of course, the diaspora, which has now become an institutional life, it actually took root at that time. They can go with the to appreciate that indeed they need to 
serve as our ambassador, Nigerian ambassador. Whatever they do there will be more important in some areas where maybe we will not even have to do a presentation. And we do that to ensure that indeed we use that as part of what we are doing. And of uh, we didn't travel out going around you know, to mobilize here and there, but we use our instrument to reach them, some of what we did at that time. And finally, if I just say this, in the totality of what we were aiming at is not just to get Nigerians mobilized to be able to play their own careers, but to add respectability for Nigeria from abroad, which would then encourage foreign investors, we also encourage those people dealing with Nigerians to it's know that it's indeed it's this is a country that is worthy of what we are doing. I thank you very much. We'll go finally to um, Senator Ike Mwachuku. Um, you know, it's very interesting when you hear how Nigeria renewed her interest in Pan-Africanism and renewed her interest in foreign policies and the global uh, community. Um, could you perhaps take us through the Abuja Treaty and why it became necessary under your belt, um, which is one of the things that, you know, was put in place um, by the foreign policy healer of our celebrant? Right, I would uh, take a bit more than a minute because uh, I want to start with certain things. First, as the Vanguardist Minister of Employment, Labor and Productivity, we set up the NDE, National Director of Employment, to create jobs for youth. We set up what we call the Job Creation Guarantee Bank Scheme to allow youth with the right proposals to collect money from the banks at the 20. Uh, we put a lot of money in 20 banks to lend to these kids, and they did a fantastic job with it. There was no strike action because the Bangida understood the synergy between government and labor, and government and employment. Now, as foreign minister, when he embarked on the structural adjustment program, we established economic diplomacy as the way forward to ensure that our missions out there didn't only talk politics but brought jobs and brought money to Nigeria, businesses to Nigeria. We engaged the private sector in policy formulation and policy implementation, thereby ensuring we had more foreign direct investment in our country and businesses flow. We are not under, under complementarity for Nigerian businessmen and women to invest in companies abroad so they could backload their profits to Nigeria and to ensure that we grew our foreign reserve. Now, in the beginning of this time, we had dual nationality to allow Nigerians abroad who, who, who could have gone further in whatever just they had abroad, but couldn't do so because they weren't nationals there. So we did that, so they could also anchor with us the, 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 the good things that, are, are, that, that they do abroad to help improve our economy. I'd like to also stress here that Babangida didn't travel as much as we thought he should do, but he had tremendous confidence in his foreign ministers. And those are countries that, that he couldn't go to. They came to Nigeria. We have Margaret Thatcher, we have Weissacker of Germany, we had the uh, President of France, we, we, we had Dan Quayle, and so on. We, we, we had uh, uh, Mugabe, and so on. And he himself also visited those, those countries. In fact, so Bangida is the second Nigerian military head of state or president that was guest to the Queen of England. Why how did this happen? Because Margaret Thatcher said that Babangida was somebody he could do business with. And so when when she said that, the entire Western world fell for Nigeria. And she therefore invited us as guest of her majesty the Queen. And at the end of which, the Queen knighted him and me 
and the others that, that came with him. And with him was his darling wife, Maria, who to me was an angel. I, I'll tell a story here. When Obengiri came to the UN to make that 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 fantastic speech, when we really planning the world order, he said the new world order for the collectively defined, collectively designed, and collectively defended. Madam Obengiri was there to support him, and so. Uh, they are about to treat it. It's all in the and, 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 and because of the trust that Africans had, they were happy to sign along that treaty. In the end, in the end, in our time, commerce and the foreign reserve, it was a pride to be in Nigeria. You would apply for a visa and you would turn down on ceremonial No one would dare pick up an Asian diplomat because they knew that if you did, we had the capability and the capacity to, to, to reciprocate. And we made sure clearly because he was a man that loved all, that, that loved humanity, that we carried this on with us in all our missions. And I am ever so delighted that I had the opportunity to work with them for Nigeria. I believe really John Age did the best you can for your country. Yes, mistakes were made. But those mistakes ought to be corrected by those that come in after us and to build a better, stronger, united country with this equity, fairness, and justice for all. Build a better and yes, stronger no in this country for those who want our lives. We thank and you, the sir. people in our country should be mobilized, like Jerry Gana said, to know their right. So, so that if any leader or group of people have the audacity to dare to put the country down, I want to thank you, sir. We seem to be losing some connection out there, and I would like to thank all my erudite panelists who have spoken well. Um, our time is far spent. I'd like to thank Professor Tunde Adeniro, the respected Professor George Obioso, Professor Bolaji Akinyemi, and uh, distinguished Senator Ike Mwachuku. Uh, what a panel this has been. I want to thank you so very much indeed. I would like to wish uh, the former president a very happy 80th birthday. This has been the panel, the Nigerian Foreign Policy Agenda and Pan-Africanism. And we'd also like to thank uh, Irelu, Aisha Babangida, uh, her brother Alhaji Muhammad Babangida, and their siblings who are here seated and those who are not here, uh, and, and the foundation for the work that they have done to bring this forward. My name is Eugenia, who it has been a pleasure to serve. Good evening. Good picture.